Television in America isn't as mature as it is in England. No, it's very good in England, things. yeah. I uh, can't watch uh, TV in America, to tell you the truth. It's such a load of rubbish. <laughs> Have you ever wondered how rock stars dated amidst their soaring popularity? As the lead guitarist of the Beatles, George Harrison not only left a mark on the world of music, but also had a life filled with intriguing stories and relationships. And what better way to uncover the mysteries of his love life than by counting down the top 10 George Harrison rumored girlfriends? Settle in, because this is going to be exciting. 10. Iris Caldwell. Everyone remembers their first love. For George Harrison, it was someone he met before even joining the Beatles. In 1957, they first connected in Liverpool, England. In 1962, she went on to date Paul McCartney. Richie Starkey, who would later become Ringo Starr, was the drummer for Rory Storm's band The Hurricanes, which she was the sister of. Vi and Ernie Caldwell welcomed Iris Violet into the world in 1945. In the words of George Harrison, Ernie was a porter in his spare time in the local hospital, Broad Green Hospital. He used to sing songs to his patients. He was a really nice fella and a window cleaner by occupation. After we'd arrived late at night, he'd go to bed and they'd all make jokes about him, but in a nice way. He was a simple, quiet, mild-mannered bloke. Iris said that the Beatles used to call her dad the Crusher and call her mom Violent Vi, and she had no idea why. They were all close, to be exact. So how did they actually meet? Alan, her brother, was a gifted vocalist who left his work as a cotton salesman to form a band known as the Texans. Later, to better fit his outrageous stage persona, he took on the colorful stage name Rory Storm. The band, the top Liverpool act of the time, changed their name to the Hurricanes, brought on Ringo Starr as a drummer, and hung out with other emerging acts like the Beatles. Alan was so committed to his new persona that he legally acquired his stage name through a deed poll and gave 54 Broad Green Road, Stormsville, as the address of his residence. In December 1964, the trio only put out one track, which did not chart, and Rory declined to pursue any recording opportunities. Iris thought that he was happy to be the king of Liverpool. He was never keen on touring, he didn't want to give up running for the Pembroke Harriers, and he'd never miss a Liverpool football match. Anyway, at the age of 12, Iris fell in love with George Harrison, a 14-year-old boy. When she was 12 and he was 14, she met George at the ice rink. He would visit her home every evening after school. He was trying to join Rory's band and used to play guitar, but Rory told him he was a little too young. They spent a long time together, but back then, dating was very different from what it is today. They would stroll along Lily Road, which resembled a road for lovers. They eventually broke up because of childish reasons. According to Iris, George insulted her friends, so she was upset. Vi, her mother, recalled that George used to come and watch TV three times a week. He and Iris used to sit there holding hands. It was the first time either of them had ever taken any interest in someone of the opposite sex. At Iris's 14th birthday party, she remembers George turned up in a brand new Italian-style suit covered with buttons. As in most teenage parties, they kept on playing kissing games and somehow or other, George and Iris always ended up together. She was undoubtedly George's first girlfriend, but he wasn't sure how she felt about the relationship. Iris and George were inseparable up until he became interested in music, at which point his new love eclipsed his interest in her, stated George's sister Louise. He even tried out for the Hurricanes, her brother's band, but was turned down for membership. All of the family remained extremely good friends with George, even though he had failed to get into Rory's band and had stopped dating Iris. Iris had dance training and was hired to perform at Liverpool's Tower Ballroom. When she was 17 years old, in December 1961, she met Paul McCartney, a young guy who was sharing the bill with the Beatles. His gaze was fixed on her when she performed The Twist, and he was so taken back by her fishnet stocking legs and her established career in show business that they quickly started dating. No love was declared, and nothing was ever serious between the two. 
<laughs> one of the things you did was visit Clay. What's oh, no. <laughs> one of the things you did was visit Cl Cassius there. Clay. There's a big lad. Who's gonna win? Nine. Ruth Morrison. A big part of the Beatles' success may be attributed to Ruth George, who along with her group of friends helped the best family decorate, and who was ultimately able to perform live with John Lennon's band at the recently opened Casbah Club. One night, the three were sitting in Lowlands Club, drinking coffee, moaning about the fact that we were not playing when Ruth suggested we saw Mrs. Best in the Casbah Club, recounts George, who was performing with his friend Ken Brown at the time. Ruth Morrison was a bright and gorgeous young girl from Liverpool who became quite noticeable to a little boy called George Harrison in 1958. He had always talked about ladies with his friends and flirted with the schoolgirls in the area, but until he met Ruth, he had never been completely infatuated with a woman. Ruth and Ken were close friends, and Ken remembers how Ruth was obsessed with George, but he was too preoccupied with his music to spend much time with girls. George had no interest in girls back then. We took a few pictures, but that was it. He was more into music. Ruth was crazy about George, but he wasn't, so I was worried about it. After the relationship with George ended, she decided to pursue a nursing career and relocated to Birmingham. What do you and Ringo do while John and Paul write songs? Uh, we play marbles. Or marples. Excuse me. 8. Pauline Bean. It seems like most of George's rumored girlfriends were from Liverpool. Pauline Bean worked as a secretary at the Construction Cooperative Society and loved music. Her first passion was jazz, but after witnessing Paul McCartney play Lend Me Your Comb at the Casbah Club, she became an absolute rock and roll and Beatles fan. Although John was originally drawn to her, George eventually dated her in 1960 when the Beatles traveled to Germany. But because of the Beatles, Pauline actually met her true love. Pauline met Jerry Marsden, who would later form Jerry and the Pacemakers at one of its outputs. She had made it obvious that she had a boyfriend, so they parted ways a few times as friends. They talked after George had contacted them as he got back from Hamburg. Although none of them took Jerry's confession of love for Pauline seriously, their relationship eventually broke up because Pauline had a very different perspective than George had. On their next date, George took Pauline to the movies and asked her to choose between her and Jerry because he didn't want her to go on dates with Jerry while she was his girlfriend and because Jerry had made it clear he would fight for her affections and not back down. Despite Pauline's decision to go out with Jerry, she and George remained close friends. Jerry recalls that he often phoned her afterwards to ask how she was, if she was happy, which was nice. Pauline continued to be heavily involved in the Liverpool music scene and enjoyed attending Jerry's shows in the neighborhood. Sadly, he played in some pretty rough locations. Once, in Old Swan, there was a big brawl right before his band started playing, so he took Pauline and her companion into the dressing area off stage to make sure they wouldn't get wounded. Though it took a while for Jerry and the Pacemakers to land a record deal, the couple was still together when their hit song, How Do You Do It, reached the top of the charts. She stayed close to George but went with Jerry. Jerry and Pauline wed in St. Mary's Church, Woolton, Liverpool on October 11, 1965. And you've all got to have somewhere where you can go and breathe out and not be faced, you know, with all the, the clutter in life. And, and 7. Bernadette Farrell Living in Childwall was a young hairdresser named Bernadette. When she started visiting the Cavern Club regularly in early 1961, she saw the Beatles for the first time and became an ardent fan. She received a note through the door from George, a neighbor, two years later when she was 17, asking her on a date. After Bernadette had gone to the movies with Paul McCartney and returned to the home of Liverpool musician Rory Storm, she met George. George was there, she states. After we started talking a few weeks later, I found a note asking to speak with him by phone slipping through the door. He made plans for us to visit the Abbey Cinema as soon as I called. However, dating a band member who was about to become a household name was no easy task. According to Bernadette, 
A few girls noticed George and started asking for his autograph as we were leaving the movie theater. He hurried me out of the house and into the car. She and George had to keep their developing romance a secret since Brian Epstein, the Beatles' manager, had forbidden the boys from dating. When other fans learned about it, though, they would write resentful letters to Bernadette Salon. She reveals, Jealous fans would write, saying, My friend Mary doesn't like you because you went out with George. The couple found solace from the pandemonium at Bernadette's house, where her mother, Peggy Farrell, would make George his tea. It was a place for him to get away from all the chaos, according to Bernadette. He used to drop by after shows. Sadly, though, the pair chose to end their relationship amicably as George's success began to take his attention away from her more frequently, and Bernadette never harbored any animosity toward his choice to go and pursue his career. Later, in 1963, with the Beatles' departure to London, the two broke up. Still, Bernadette preserved George's love letters, which are now on exhibit in Liverpool's The Beatles Story Museum, which she co-owns with her husband, Mike Byrne. According to Bernadette, now from Formby Maryside, it was only a teenage romance. I thought I loved him at the time, but he was three years older, and I was only about 16, she continued. We had great pain and misery together and we had a lot of problems as everybody knows we went up and down and round and round and at this stage of my life I can look back on it and really remember the good things about it. 6. Estelle Bennett When people started to become famous they would often share the same friend groups or know the same faces. Decades ago Bennett had dated Mick Jagger, George Harrison, Johnny Mathis and George Hamilton. She was silent, Ross remarked. She was not pretentious at all, but she carried herself with a sophistication that a lot of guys thought was really sexy, and she had a very, very good heart. Being the quiet members of their own bands didn't make George Harrison of the Beatles and Estelle Bennett of the Ronettes get along. In the early 1960s, the press gave them nicknames for their unidentified reasons, although neither George nor Bennett were the quiet Beatle or the quiet Ronette. At a 1964 party, George and Bennett would never have struck up a discussion with one another if they were truly silent. They also wouldn't have dated or spoke on the phone for hours at a time late at night. The Beatles' first tour of the United Kingdom is where the girl group originally met, according to Bennett's sister and fellow Ronette, Ronnie Spector, in 1964. Following their attendance at a showbiz party in London, both groups quickly became buddies. Two of the Beatles, nevertheless, had different ideas. George set his sights on Bennett, while John Lennon made moves towards Ronnie Spector, but she turned him down since she was seeing someone else. Once they exchanged words, they discovered that their similarities went much beyond the press's description of them as reserved. Bennett stated to Weekly View, No matter how many other people were in the room, we kept running into each other at parties and gatherings, and always found our eyes meeting. Every time George and her crossed paths, they had a conversation. Bennett fell in love with George at that point, much like the majority of the entire world. He had a way of making me feel comfortable sharing whatever was on my mind, the woman said. Spectre rejected John, but they stayed friends. I think he felt the same way, because he'd often call late in the evening and talk on the phone for hours. So their double date with George and Bennett wasn't uncomfortable, even though the sister's mother inadvertently went along. My mother toured with us everywhere, Spectre explained to people. John and George were picking us up at the hotel to take us to dinner. They were so nice and polite. They said, Mrs. Bennett, would you like to go to dinner with us? And my mother said, sure, let me get my purse. Regretfully, the Beatles' departure for Paris coincided with the Ronettes' departure for their American comeback ending George and Bennett's romance. When the Beatles made their first American tour, the two met each other again, but George was different. The Beatles didn't know what to do with themselves when they arrived in America. With Beatlemania at an all-time high, the band was practically confined to their hotel rooms. Spectre claimed that the Ronettes were the first friends the Beatles considered asking for assistance. They didn't know anybody in America, so me, Estelle, and Nedra, the three Ronettes, would go up there. He said, please bring the 45 records, so we'd sit there on the floor and listen to records. We had the best time. 
I remember he got upset because the Supremes came in. Because people came in just to take pictures with them. Thus, the Beatles' main comfort in their chaotic life at the moment came from the Ronettes. They were unable to be who they were in America, unlike in their hometown when the Ronettes visited. When Bennett attempted to rekindle her romance with George, she came to this realization. Bennett is correct. With that tour and all the others, George had to shed his Beatles skin. As a result, he wasn't himself and was unable to maintain the same level of connection with Bennett as they had in the United Kingdom. It wasn't intimate, but they remained friends and created wonderful moments together. Quite nice. It's just long enough to get the feel of it. Not too long to I get to dislike it. Yeah, I had a good time. 5. Kathy Simmons Every woman George Harrison dated was interesting, Kathy Simmons included. During the brief time in 1974 that separated Patty and Olivia, George was romantically involved with Kathy Simmons. Kathy went around with a bunch of rock and roll guys. Before she started dating George, she was in relationships with Rod Stewart and Harry Nilsson. Kathy was a former movie star and model. Her career included modeling, where she appeared on the top of the pops. In 1968, she portrayed Samson in the groupie movie The Touchables, which was helmed by renowned Beatles photographer Robert Freeman. When she started dating George Harrison, she was barely 24 years old. During this period, George was consuming copious amounts of alcohol and using illicit substances while working on numerous projects simultaneously. He and Kathy had a vacation at St. George Bay in Granada in August 1974. She moved in with George at a little villa close to St. George's Bay in Granada, believing that their connection would develop into something more profound and meaningful, possibly even considering George to be her real love. Before George departed for Los Angeles to organize his first solo concert tour, they enjoyed a few blissful weeks together. It was clear that the affair was only a one-time fling for George when Harrison left alone for Los Angeles, leaving Kathy devastated. You know, George won't allow meat in the house, and I've come to think that leather shoes, fur coats, and so on are unnecessary too. She started meditating. It wasn't difficult to learn. She's studying the Krishna religion. I won't be a hypocrite and pretend to believe in it straight away. Had she changed him at all? I persuaded him to get his hair cut shorter, she says. One of my best friends is a hairstylist, and he had given George a great new look. She realized that George is quiet, a gentle person who just likes to be left alone to get on with his work. But it is wonderful to know someone from whom you can learn so much. George traveled to America in 1974 as part of his Dark Horse tour, leaving Kathy behind in England. George's relationship with Kathy ended the moment he saw Olivia in person, and from then on, it was all Olivia. Because Kathy thought George was her one true love, she was devastated. It became clear to her that George was only having this affair as a casual fling. She finally got married and gave birth to two sons. She called one of them George. In 2017, Kathy passed away. Claude, and once you get used to the fact they're not all drunk and screaming like they are in America maybe, then uh, it's, it's okay. It was better for me to, to test the atmosphere here. 4. Chrissy Wood Like the girls previously described, Chrissy Finlay was an extreme groupie who had affairs with Jimmy Page, Eric Clapton, George Harrison, and John Lennon prior to her marriage to Ronnie Wood, which led her to becoming Chrissy Wood. Few rock girls could boast as much or even nearly as much as that. Chrissy Finlay was a blonde, tall, and extremely beautiful person. It's not difficult to imagine that she started a lucrative modeling career in the 1970s. Her love of live music and dance began while she was a student at Greg Grammar School in Ealing. She met Ronnie Wood, her future husband, in 1964 when she was just 16 years old. Ronnie played guitar for the Small Faces at the time. The pair tied the knot in 1971. Ronnie writes in his autobiography, Chrissy had a short fling with George. They holidayed in Portugal. Remember, I'd pinched Chrissy from Eric, and later, after Patty and Eric split up, I had a lovely thing going with Patty. 
We love to go to Paradise Island on many occasions where Sam Clapp gave us his home and hospitality. With her husband's unwavering support, Chrissy Wood took off for a Portuguese villa with George Harrison, the lead guitarist for the Beatles. Unbeknownst to her, he only gave her a cent because he intended to travel to Barbados with Harrison's spouse, model Patty Boyd. What a surprise, right? George Harrison and Chrissy Wood appeared to be deeply in love when they returned to England. They got together at Harrison's Oxfordshire house with their matching spouses. Regretfully, it's still unclear what transpired after the couples disclosed their holiday relationships. Do you want to know more? Because not long later, on a trip to Los Angeles, Chrissy Wood began an affair with John Lennon, who was then married to Yoko Ono. Lennon called her Patty, and it seemed to constantly confuse her with Harrison's wife. Thus, the affair didn't last long. A couple of years later, Paul had the drug too. And the TV people in England came and they said, so you've had this wonder drug LSD. Three, Maureen Starkey. The music world was truly, truly wild in the past. We wonder how these relationships were even permitted to happen. Former Beatle George Harrison had a brief affair with Ringo Starr's wife in 1973, the wife of his former bandmate and still close pal. John Lennon's Tittenhurst Park mansion was purchased by Starr from his bandmate in 1971. The 26-room Berkshire property was the scene of the beginning of the Starr's marriage disintegration, as the drummer and his wife hosted frequent parties there. Author Chris O'Dell, a close friend of the Harrisons and Stars and an employee of the Beatles' Apple Corporation, detailed the unpleasant event in her book Miss O'Dell, Hard Days and Long Nights with the Beatles, the Stones, Bob Dylan, and Eric Clapton. We sat at the long wooden table in the kitchen, Ringo and George on one bench, Patty and I facing them on the opposite bench, O'Dell wrote. Maureen spent the entire evening flitting around like a little bird, landing here, then there, jumping up to cook an omelet for Ringo, refilling our drinks, bringing plates of food to the table. At some point, Harrison, who had been spending a lot of time alone with Ringo's wife in the weeks before that night, turned to Ringo and said, You know, Ringo, I'm in love with your wife, according to Odell. Odell expressed her ire at Harrison for his indifference to his wife Boyd's feelings, who was seated across from her, and said that Ringo's only response was a quiet, better you than someone we don't know. Yikes! Was that a response out of frustration? In Ringo, with a little help, Michael Seth Starr wrote about how the photograph singer was actually horrified by the revelation describing how things only got worse when Boyd returned home to the Friar Park mansion she shared with Harrison weeks later and found George in bed with Maureen. Patty Boyd said in a book about her marriage to George Harrison how the couple's relationship broke down as Beatles' discord increased. Around that time, Patty noticed that George started to cheat on her. By 1973, George had become disoriented and was pursuing Maureen. He first declared his love for Maureen in front of Ringo and the two women. The Beatles' social life was guarded due to their reputation, and they grew close to each other and their spouses. So it wouldn't be odd if one or the other arrived at someone's house late. But when Maureen started spending the night, Patty felt something was off. The marriage between Ringo and Maureen didn't last very long either. In 1975, following multiple extramarital affairs and Ringo's descent into alcoholism, the couple concluded their divorce. All things considered, rock and roll musicians in the 1970s were no strangers to marriage and divorce. However, most people concur that George was inappropriate in his approach toward his former bandmate and friend's wife. I'm post Bryce. So like that. I've been round the bend. This, uh <laughs> this one's better. Is that better? Two, Lori Del Santo. As a Beatles fan, you probably know the beef between George and Eric Clapton. All the wife stealing, girlfriend robbing stories. The autobiography of Patty Boyd described her switch from George Harrison to Eric Clapton. Now, Lori Del Santo, the ex girlfriend of Clapton, reveals for the first time how she and Harrison got their own back with a private three-day affair. In order to exact revenge on her womanizing partner, Eric Clapton, model Lori Del Santo revealed that she had an affair with George Harrison. 
When Harrison and Clapton were on tour together in December 1991, she claims they met covertly in Hiroshima, Japan, and spent three days in Harrison's opulent suite at the Sun Plaza Hotel behind closed doors. Lori characterized it as a sweet revenge, as it was just four years after Harrison and Patty Boyd were married in the 1960s that Clapton infamously stole her. The model-turned-TV presenter, who was born in Italy, claims that Clapton had frozen her out following the untimely death of their four-year-old son Connor, which is another reason why she desired retribution. Patty's autobiography revealed the incredible tale of how Clapton wooed her. The rock icon was so enamored of her that he told Harrison straight out, I have to tell you man, I'm in love with your wife, and proceeded to kidnap her after penning the iconic song Layla in her honor. In an incredible turn of events, Lori has now revealed how Harrison exacted his vengeance by secretly inviting her to his suite. They were both going through a difficult time because they had both been harmed by Clapton. Clapton wouldn't talk about it, so Harrison lost Patty and Lori had to deal with her son's passing alone. In an interview, Lori quotes renowned journalist Daphne Barak as saying, It was amazing. We had so much to talk about. I will never forget that time. The memories of those three days are still with me. Harrison, who was still pissed off by Clapton's blatant attention to his wife, used the chance to ask Lori about the rock star's womanizing ways. The pair talked about the terrible impact Clapton had on their lives together while unwinding in Harrison's apartment. Harrison later made arrangements to have the hotel's Olympic-sized pool closed off so that the two could use it alone. In the pool, he was so sweet, recalls Lori. Three months after little Connor died after falling out of the couple's 53rd floor New York apartment window, when Lori's back was turned for a brief moment during the incident. The couple was torn apart by the tragedy, and they split up soon after. He probably had revenge in his mind, but so did I. We were both hurt and angry with Eric, but what might have started as revenge became so special. Not everything went as planned. The relationship was never disclosed to Clapton. It is not that George and I were hiding, Lori responds, but we spent a lot of time in his suite upstairs. We wanted to have a private time, so both George and I got even with Eric. I didn't want to tell Eric or talk about it. I didn't want to ruin the moment. Harrison said a heartfelt goodbye as the pair departed. Lori shares, He called me and said, I hope to see you. He did everything to perfection. No gifts. What a legendary couple they would have been if they decided to stay together. Doing that and enjoying each other's company and with Ringo, having dinner, just having a laugh, and for some strange reason, he, he decided to superimpose some old business thing that was getting solved. 1. Patty Boyd Patty Boyd is most known as a rock and roll groupie, but we're familiar with her because she was in the middle of the most controversial love triangle in music history. Eric Clapton is a guitar god, to be sure. George Harrison, nevertheless, was a Beatle. Patty Boyd, the legendary fashion model whose elegance and grace defined a time, stands between them. Her name will always be associated with the songs that she inspired her well-known ex-husbands to write. Harrison's Something and Clapton's Layla and Wonderful Tonight. Currently, she is presenting her own classic works of art. As her career took off, she received offers to appear in television commercials. One of these spots was for Smith's Potato Chips, and it was directed by a young director named Richard Lester. Boyd then received a call in early 1964 regarding other planned projects. She thought it was simply another commercial at first, but later found out it was for a whole other kind of employment. A Hard Day's Night, her debut feature picture, was offering her a modest role. That's where it all began. When the band arrived on the set, their humor instantly put her at ease. The Beatles said hello to us girls and they were adorable. They were so charming and fun straight away. They bowled everyone over. I just fell for them. George Harrison could tell she had feelings for him too, since he asked her to marry him shortly after they first spoke. The musician, 21, pulled back when the startled boy did not respond. He said, if you won't marry me, will you at least have dinner with me? 
Sadly, she was already dating someone else, adding her to the small group of ladies who have declined a date with a beetle. She remembers he looked crestfallen. I thought, aw, poor guy. She asked Harrison to supper with her and her partner in an attempt to lessen the impact. She laughs. This was not what he had in mind. After a little bit of magic, a 10-year romance started at that point. Their top secret wedding took place on January 21, 1966 at a London registry office. Boyd was under severe orders not to discuss it for fear of a fan invasion. Grateful bridal party gown shopping was not going to happen. I would love to have told all my friends, she replies, but I just told my mother. That's not really that much fun, is it? It was hard to share her husband with the world. Harrison's nights with Boyd began to mirror his troubled days with the Beatles. When Harrison became close to a recent ex of his close friend Eric Clapton, things hit rock bottom in early January 1969. As Boyd would later describe it in her 2007 biography, Uncomfortably Close, it caused her to briefly vacate the house they shared. Harrison's growing dissatisfaction with the Beatles was intensified by this personal issue, and a few days later, he left a session with the intention of permanently leaving the group. John Lennon made the oddly appropriate but probably satirical suggestion that they bring on Clapton as a substitute guitarist right away. The band split in 1970, and the marriage reached a turning point that same year. George was starting to distance himself from me, Boyd says. She reunited with Clapton a few weeks after their breakup, after he had professed his unwavering love for her during her time with his friend. Then, from 1979 to 1989, Clapton and Boyd were married. Patty was, without a doubt, George's greatest love. And that concludes our journey through the romantic tales of the quiet Beatle himself, George Harrison. We hope you enjoyed uncovering the fascinating stories behind his rumored love interests. That's all for now. Thank you so much for watching.